Oh, we're such jaded hosts. Yeah. I feel good about that, though, because to be eager and wanting to please just isn't my style, so at least I know I'm being true to myself. Mm. <laughs> uh, yeah. Do we just go right into introductions, or what are we doing? Do you, Or do you have a... I'm just along for the ride. What's happening tonight? Uh, well, I'm Ryan. I heart my grand dog, McKenna. And I'm Harland. Rig up a complication grant. And uh, we are the Doddlers. And this is the Doddlers Philosophy Podcast. <laughs> Somebody had his uppers today. All right, so. Get into it. What are we talking about? You got a take on something, or you got a no. a quote about something? <laughs> oh, the, the possibilities are endless. You know how I talked about how I we do all the holidays. The next one is American Thanksgiving. If you know, you give thanks anywhere else. Local Probably don't holiday. do it on the last Thursday of November yeah. of every year. But what do we eat on Thanksgiving, Harlan? <laughs> well, the the norm, the tradition is that a person would center a meal around a turkey. What the fuck is a turkey? I don't know, it's like a it's a bird. What's a bird? What's a bird? I don't know, it's like it's like a fucking it's a dinosaur or oh, something, right? Oh, that's right. Now I'm no expert on dinos. I've always been more of a mammal guy. Uh but that's what we're gonna talk about today. <clears throat> Dinosaurs for Thanksgiving. And oh. apparently we're being gymnastic here with that stretch. <laughs> But you I'm know, up for it. Yeah. <laughs> what is this like the six degrees of Kevin Bacon or whatever? You can get anything to relate to anything else, so long as you just kind of keep going. Mm, turkey bacon. This is a good tight coupling, though, of like dinos to birds to turkeys to Thanksgiving. I mean, it's pretty good. Anyway. So, yeah, that's what we're going to talk about. Um but yeah, I'm I'm not an expert on this topic. It's not my. It, it wasn't the thing that gave me juice about paleontology. I don't fucking know anymore what gave me juice about paleontology, other than like saber tooth cats. Uh, but whatever. Um, you know, I like the ecosystems and. But saber tooth cats don't relate to Thanksgiving. <laughs> closely so enough, we can't talk about them. Um. But yeah, I I I never really dove deep into the vertebrate paleontology culture other than through the people I knew who were deep in it. And then of course the things that I'd read, um, but rumor has it that dinosaur paleontology can be uh, pretty cavalier and egotistical and stuff like that. Um, You know, just because it's dinosaurs and, Everybody loves dinosaurs. Or at uh, least did when they were a child. Speaking of being childs, uh, I interestingly enough, if you think about it, those people who become dinosaur paleontologists, it's like they never went off track in their entire lives. They were like, because if they were kids and they loved dinosaurs and they're adults and they're dinosaur paleontologists, then they were just like, yep, I'm just going to go beeline, no curves, no bends, no crooked 
directions, no off-roading, just going to go straight in from my childhood to my adulthood. Dedication. <clears throat> I feel like it's got to be luck, but whatever. Some dedications in there, too, I guess. Anyway, uh, for those people who are interested out there, the reign of the non-avian dinosaurs lasted roughly from like 240 million years ago to 66 million years ago. And in the Megadeth episode that we did, feels like years ago now, uh, there was a moment where I quoted, I think his name is Peter Brannon. I can't remember his name anymore. Something like that. But he wrote a book about uh, geology and I quoted a passage about the end Cretaceous extinction at 66 million years ago. The asteroid instantaneously put a hole in the ground more than 20 miles deep, deep enough astoundingly to puncture the Earth's mantle and stretching more than 60 miles wide. Over the next few unimaginable seconds, the Earth behaved like the surface of a pond after a rock has been thrown Complex peaks and ripples resonated throughout the Yucatan before being frozen in place as crazy ready-made mountain ranges that would have loomed over the crater floor as high as the Himalayas. End quote. So, that's a very... Jesus Christ! (laughs) Anyway. That was the whole... What the asteroid that ended the dinosaurs, or what is that still yeah. a, the popular theory? Or <clears throat> I don't think it's like one of the things about paleontology is that there's no real like one single silver bullet that like does the thing. It's always like, well, it was a whole bunch of things, and it's like, of course it was. Um, that sounds reasonable. They, I think you know they ought to if they don't should call that the you know those things um and of course i can't remember the name of the damn movie but one paleontologist has the calls it that but it's a movie where it's a everyone killed the person kind of thing what's the name of that movie god damn it not a clue but you're saying everyone contributed a little bit and without any of the the there is no sine qua non there's only a bunch of contributing factors. Yeah. <clears throat> Damn it. They made a movie. I'm I'm not going anywhere until we find this fucking movie's name. Hold on. Uh m- m- where everyone <laughs> killed uh whatever. I don't know. <clears throat> oh, come on. All I get is when I hit murder mystery, it's just Netflix murder mystery. Google hasn't seen it either, I guess. Murder on the something train, murder on the Orient Express. I think that's what it is. So these are like murder on the Orient Express hypotheses where it's just like, yeah, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Yeah. See, it was worth it. Um. So, yeah, that was the... the, the, the End Cretaceous mass extinction, I think the asteroid essentially kind of tipped over whatever may have been in decline, you know, um, because it's, as far as I know, that no one would say, yes, everything was going just dandy, and then all of a sudden this meteorite came along and ruined everything. I think that's the popular story, but I think probably do- paleontologists and geologists might not agree to that fully whatever <clears throat> we've already spent too much time on that <laughs> all right but here's the thing harland what and i i'm asking this as a genuine question to people out there you know uh you know besides well okay what is it about dinosaurs that interests people i, I stephen jay gould often would repeat the phrase you know a uh, giant, fierce, and extinct, or something like that. You know, like that's why kids like them because they can't hurt them, but they're still a. Tr- you know, it's like the whole Darth Vader thing. It's like they have the power. I'm a kid. I'm powerless. Whatever. There maybe would be some kind of 
aesthetic quality, a uh, little bit of danger, but within the safety of your whatever, you know, like it's like why do kids like pirates and knights and shining armor and cowboys and Indians? It's all very exciting, but no place for a kid, you know, to be in a saloon with the bullets flying or whatever. And yet that's kind of maybe in some ways what kids tend to think about. Anyway. Um, yeah, I don't know why. I think that's a good question. I'm also interested if there is an answer. It's probably another Orient Express type scenario. Yeah. Um, that they are, or might as well be, fictional. Because there aren't any around now, maybe, is part of it. But then you've got that, well, we can take you to the museum and show you a skeleton. and oh, They're like less fictional than your unicorns and dragons and whatever. Yeah. So they're in this kind of uh, gray area. Is it a real thing or not a real thing? And then there's also, I think, somewhere in there, the kids like what they're presented with factor. And at some point, some prominent, the Jane Goodall of dinosaurs or whatever, must have made an influential book or TV show or something. And it just got started and then people started capital applying capitalism to it and they became a market because you know kids just like whatever put in front of them right i mean they like some things you put in front of them you know but most of the things they put in front of them seem to have had some kind of like marketing research where like it's you know primary colors and you know again there may be an element of danger some sort of aesthetic appeal or something like that but yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's we could go circle around each other about that one. Um, but for me, at least when it comes to like, what's an interest scientifically in dinosaurs? Like, what is it about fucking dinosaurs? Who cares? You know, it's that kind of thing. Why is it we're so enamored with dinosaurs and not, you know, whatever, the, the proto or, you know, not proto mammal, but like the sort of the... the lizards or lizards the sorry the reptiles that are that led to say mammals why aren't we interested in those guys back in the permian and you know they seem like they were kind of interesting too right you know but we we don't really get enamored with them and i kind of think one one key factor which is i think a key factor in dinosaur success on the planet as a you know group of animals it has to do with their posture and gait. Something very boring sounding, I'm sure. Yeah, that's, it's already interesting that you would make this claim. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> it has to do with... There's different kinds of, you know, I guess you could say uh, gates or whatever. So you have this sort of sprawl, sprawling kind of gait where, they, where the arms are kind of out to the side... And more or less, the stomach just kind of rubs on the ground. While the like arms... sort of Gila monster style or something? Yeah. Right. A lot of lizards have that kind of, it's all splayed out. And of course, amphibians are that way. Really, it's just, hey, these were once fins, you know, mm. <laughs> or whatever. Uh, and so they're just out to the side. Um, and then there's, you know, so besides sprawling, there's semi-erect, then there's something called pillar erect, and then just finally, like, whatever, traditional erect. Um, I got to get this out of the way because I keep saying the word erect, you know? And it's like geology and paleontology is just, like, full of this shit. Like, it's erect, or what is the other one? Orogeny rather than erogeny, you know? Like, all these things seem to always infiltrate the language as if these geeks didn't realize, like... Or you know, did decades. they realize all too well? Oh, maybe, <laughs> maybe. But if they didn't, they didn't realize like decades later, like there'd be, uh, you know, fucking Bill and Ted and uh, uh, fucking Beavis and Butthead and shit, whatever. But there are these different kinds of gates, and the sprawling again is the spread out kind of your belly's on the ground. Semi erect is kind of like you can do push ups with four legs, you know. And your belly can be off the ground, you know? And a pillar erect is, it's like you've got your legs coming right up into the trunk of the body, like straight up into it, you know, that kind of thing. And then 
sort of the traditional erect as we think about it because we're so fucking selfish and self-oriented uh would be it comes you know the ball and socket things come in from the side you know so that's kind of the way that the bone structure works uh you know examples well terrestrial animals that aren't birds or anim or mammals have a s sprawling or semi-erect gait like amphibians and all reptiles but crocodiles are, are like pretty much just like yep i'm gonna be sprawling and then croc crocodilians if you will they can do both sprawling and semi-erect if they're like have full bu full bellies they're sprawling and if they've got like a need to run after something they're in a sort of semi-erect state or whatever um of their gait so um now it is time to move our way towards some quotes but when you said you wanted some examples, was I giving you examples just then or no? Yeah, like crocodiles or whatever. Yeah, there's a semi-erect kind mm -hmm. of game. There was a, um, speaking of pillar erect, as far as I know, the, I think the only real examples I know of that are the pillar erect type of gate, you know, is this uh, other crocodilians that had a, you know, fully kind of like legs underneath them. And they kind of ran, you know, but they still, the trunk of the body Still very much like a crocodile or alligator. It's weird to think of, but it's sort of the way that they've reconstructed the bones as to how the, you know, the leg bone connects to... The... <laughs> Is this a pillar... I mean, I know it's not a reptile. Is the pillar erect thing like a giraffe, you mean? Mm -mm. No. It would be a reptile, like a cr crocodile, this pillar erect style, that I, as I understand it. So that was a strategy a morphological strategy that was used by some of the crocodilians where they kind of gave up on this semi-erect sprawling like depend you know the sort of this uh thing where they can ch you know not ch well yeah i guess they can kind of choose what they want to do i think pillar erect is a little more committed to standing upright and i think after the actual the extinction of the dinosaurs there were some crocodilians that were were pillar erect i don't know about before you know, during the, the age of the dinosaurs, if there were any kind of pillar erect crocodilians, I'm sure any there are paleontologists out there that do know if there were. Um, but yeah, so the idea though is why, what is so special about you know, erections? <laughs> <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> Grow up in here. This is a you know, we're adults. Yeah. Question mark? Yeah. We're uh, sometimes. All right. So the uh, there's this guy who was a paleontologist named David Carrier. And he is talked about in this one book that I, it was a textbook by this paleontologist, Richard Cowan, called History of Life. I used it when I taught paleontology classes. Um, and uh, he talks about you know, this, this whole, like, w what do you get with having an erect gating or gate or whatever, um, to your, to your stance. And he's talking about this work by this guy, David Carrier, um, who published a kind of seminal paper, if you will, in 1987. And I think it was in paleobiology. I, I can't remember. Um, but anyway, Richard Cowan writes, and there'll be some sort of lengthy quotes here, but you're going to love it. Anyway, he's talking about uh, the situation it is, as it is for, you know, lizards and amphibians and, you know, or, you know, basic reptiles before the dinosaurs and mammals and stuff. Okay. Tetrapods, which are four-legged animals. Tetrapods moving about on land face a much more serious problem. The shoulder girdle and the forelimbs in particular, powered in part by the muscles of the trunk, are largely devoted to supporting and moving the body over the ground. In the sprawling gait of amphibians and living reptiles, the trunk is twisted first to one side and then the other in walking and running. As the animal steps forward with its left front foot, the right side of the chest and the lung inside it are compressed while the left side expands. 
<clears throat> so it's a, I'm like doing this for Harland and no one else can see me do it. Whatever. Then the cycle reverses with the next step. This distortion of the chest interferes with and essentially prevents normal breathing in which the chest cavity and, uh, and both lungs expand uniformly and then contract. If the animal is walking, it may be able to breathe between steps, but sprawling vertebrates cannot run and breathe at the same time. Something he calls carrier's constraint. Um, and he goes on to talk about, uh, you know, a little bit more stuff. He talks about animals can run for a while without breathing. For example, Olympic sprinters usually don't breathe during a 100-meter race. Animals can generate temporary energy by anaerobic glycolysis, breaking down food molecules in the blood supply without using oxygen. Um. And it's kind of like, you know, having an afterburner in like a jet engine or something like that. Um, but then he goes on, he says, living amphibians and reptiles then can hop or run fast for a short time, first using up the oxygen stored in their lungs and blood, then switching to anaerobic glycolysis. They cannot sprint for long, however. If lizards want to breathe, they have to stand still with feet symmetrical. Lizards run in short rushes with frequent stops. By attaching recorders to the body, David Carrier, the paleontologist, showed that the stops are for breathing and that lizards don't breathe as they run. Therefore, all living amphibian and reptile carnivores use ambush tactics to capture agile prey. Chameleons and toads flip their tongues at passing insects, for example. So anyway... So That's there's some cool. makes sense. It's yeah. one of those things that you wouldn't think I wouldn't have that thought just sitting around. But when presented with it, it sounds plausible and it's interesting and whatever. Yeah. When you move your legs underneath your body, then you can just you're essentially uncoupling these these systems because as he says later, early tetrapods all had sprawling gates and faced this problem. Their respiration and locomotion used the, much of the same sets of muscles, and both systems could not operate at the same time. But later, when you put it down, you've got this ability to, uh, you know, use your muscles, you know, without crunching your chest and your lungs and all that, so you can breathe and run at the same time. So therefore, you can imagine ecologically and energetically, you have kind of a new open space to explore and you know you can capture prey a lot faster and if they don't get up on their feet they're fucked you know and start moving you know that kind of thing um you can just run them down and yep. they'll run out of air and have to stop exactly um so they have this hip uh you know the the pelvic girdle has got you know, this ball and socket from the side for us or from directly underneath for this sort of pillar erect gait. And then ankles were also important, kind of like the way you see uh, hinges on a door. You know, it's the same kind of principle. You just have a hinge joint, hinge joint with rollers, essentially, um, except for the, you know, crocodilians today have sort of different kind of ankle arrangements because they do splay and then do the semi erect thing. Anyway, so that's kind of I, I, that's a part that to me, like when I first learned that about dinosaurs in particular, that they also do this like mammals. I was like, oh yeah, okay, that's huge. That's not just a, that's not you know, um, it's not like dinosaurs ruled the earth because they were meaner, you know, or <laughs> yeah, because they knew how to walk and breathe at the same time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They knew how to talk and chew gum at the same time. So that, I don't know, I always love that. You know, that stuff, like, really, uh, you know, tickles my fancier. What's my whistle? Anyway. Is that all uh, kosher for y'all? Yep. Were, are you still building towards it? Or were, had you said something about you have a hypothesis that something about the gate is why humans like them? Isn't that what you'd started off with? Well, I was thinking, like, what about scientifically? Like, why would there be an interest scientifically? Or how would we figure out why dinosaurs are of... Or what is it that a person who is a dinosaur paleontologist would, 
you know, remark as, you know, interesting or whatever about dinosaurs other than, you know, because you've got the popular culture account of things, which is, you know, big, fierce and extinct or mm-hmm. whatever. And then, uh, you know, Jurassic Park and all that. But what do the professionals care about, you know? And um, my thinking was that that's got to be a big one. That's got to be a big one that they do care about. That seems to make it into the textbooks. It also seems to make it into part of, you know, the reason why potentially they were as successful as they were when they were. I'll get into that in a second. But um, other than that, uh, that's, you know, that's it for the the kind of the morphology, the the thing about the animal of the dinosaur that I have noted in my head. Okay. Looks like a space here. I was, I was like, I should have asked this at the very beginning. Okay. Uh, what what is I mean? What does dinosaur mean? What is a dinosaur? How do we delineate this category? Where does it start and stop? Type thing. Okay. Um, dinosaurs. Uh, I'm like, great question. <laughs> what is a dinosaur? It's a big lizard. No. Um. Dinosaurs, as 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 I would understand it, are one of the, um, you know, certainly one of the big traits for dinosaurs at this point is going to be this erect, um, traditional erect kind of stance, um, and there are other characteristics that join dinosaurs with, um, you know, like pterodactyls, pterodactylians or whatever, and uh, uh, crocodilians. And these all are somewhat related. I don't remember all the characteristics that relate the three of them together. But a a big one for the dinosaurs that really sets them apart is the erect stance that they take. Um, But there may be other things I just don't recall. But that's a big one. Mm -hmm. You know, standing with your legs underneath your body. Um. Running and breathing at the same time. And was there another part to that question that I'm forgetting? Not really. Hmm. That may not be a very satisfying answer, but that's the one I got tonight, folks. That's a good one. I mean, I was just... There might be more, but that one's there's, fine. Oh, there's always more, right? <laughs> Jesus. But I think that's a big one. I don't think the average person thinks about that when no. they think about dinosaurs. They think big, fierce, and extinct, or something. I hope I'm getting that quote right. Whatever. So then, um, and there's this, you know, the way that people have viewed dinosaurs, though. And, and so this is good to your question uh, about, well, what makes a dinosaur a dinosaur? At first, it seems like people just didn't, they weren't sure, they didn't have all the tools and techniques for phylogenetics and cladistics and stuff like that to be able to relate things together in the way that we do now, especially with statistics and software and, um, you know, just time, you know, that's another big one. People just figuring things out better or whatever. Um, but for a while it was kind of like, they thought all of these groups of dinosaurs that are being called dinosaurs were just sort of like a mob of lineages that just all kind of figured this out more or less at the same time. And that there may not be a, you know, recent common ancestor to all of them. It was just, you know, stuff happening. Um, uh, But then later, work that was done started to group them and say, no, I think they are related. And there's these two groups. There's these Ornithetians, and these are like triceratops and some of the more armored looking ones like perhaps stegosaurs and then of course you have hadrosaurs which are the ones that are kind of still on their two feet uh or they're on their they're on their hind legs i think some of them might be on all fours but they some of them have these big head pieces that it looks like maybe they uh could make sound maybe it was mating i don't know some of these horns and uh Additional accoutrement features for some of these organisms may have also been related to mating, or they could have been, you know, for defense against predators. Um, but there was so those are the Ornithetians, 
And then there was the Sorishans or Sorishans or whatever. And that would be like, um, on the one side, you'd have like T-Rex. And on the other, you'd have quote unquote Brontosaurus. Although Brontosaurus is a nomen dubium. And somebody who named bones, presumably belonging to the same populations and lineages or whatever, uh, they named it Apatosaurus first. And then, but Brontosaurus somehow got more popular. And in order to um, correct that, one of the one of the rules that's in phylogenetics and cladistics, I guess, especially with respect to paleontology, is whoever named it first, however obscure it was. And if we all sit and agree, yeah, these bones are, you know, these, you know, bones are related in species or whatever. That, you know, however you define species. Anyway. Oh, my goodness, Knox. What happened? Did he knock something over? I Did he know. knock something over? Sorry. So, but now the thinking is that, um, and Brontosaurus, well, quote unquote, Brontosaurus or Apatosaurus, whatever, those are known as sauropods or sauropodomorpha, whatever. Um, now the thinking is that these sauropods and, and theropods, which is T-Rex and velociraptors and stuff, are actually separate from each other and that the ornithesians are with the theropods. So the triceratops are with the T-Rexes, you know, in a group. Um, and the sauropods are now with a new group called the herrerasaurs. I know everyone's dying and to know. And which ones did most of the um, the humans ride when we were... I think it was the triceratops personally, but I have no actual support for that. I just, I, I just believe it. Mm. That's all we need. <laughs> Whatever ones they rode in the movies, that'll be my answer to everything. Whatever happened in the movies, Harland, that's what happened. Yeah. So yeah, so there's been some changes in how people, paleontologists in particular, come to understand how these groups are all related to each other. And it's kind of fun because it's like, um, you know, you'll read things like, and this was the first, you know, a herbivore dinosaur, you know, and you think, oh, yeah, like it's it's like, you know, uh, you're eating meat one day and you're like, no, fuck it, I'll just eat these plants. You know, it's just like, <laughs> you know, like when you think of when I'm out when, of breath, I can't keep catching this meat. <laughs> I'm going to eat plants. <laughs> It was the lazy dinosaurs. Uh, yeah, so um, I just, I don't know, I, I just find that fascinating. Because usually when we think about, you know, herbivores, we think of them as being these peaceful bambies in the woods. And of course, they're really nothing of the kind, of the sort, because all these animals living on the wild got to survive, and they're rough and tough and letting some of their instincts help them make decisions without having to sit there and think about it for very long. So there's been some relational changes. However, I do kind of want to kind of get back to this, you know, the gate posture thing a little bit because, you know, it's like, well, another question is, well, why, why dinosaurs? Why did the dinosaurs, you know, just why, you know, like why are they so huge and, why were they, you know, so prevalent for so long? And why are they fascinating and all that kind of stuff? So when it comes to things like why did why were they successful? Um, one of the interesting things is that, you know, in terms of what paleontologists have learned, it does look like following mass extinctions there's a lot of great opportunity to be had for those who survive. And that then becomes the next kind of group that might inherit the earth kind of thing. Um, and so given that way of thinking about uh, diversification and, and whatnot, something coming on the, on the heels of a really great extinction where all of a sudden it's just, you know, for the taking or whatever, it's kind of like, Oh, okay, well, dinosaurs did that. You know, there was this not large but somewhat 
you know, there was enough of a of an extinction event to consider it, I guess, a mass extinction, which I don't remember what the definition was for that anymore, but <clears throat> maybe it's over half the lineages go extinct. But there was, uh, in the Triassic, there was a point when thing when there was a relatively large extinction event. And it's at that point that when dinosaurs, who were already around, started, they took off. They just kind of took over... Uh, you know, the land and to an extent, I guess, uh, the the oceans and whatnot. But what's interesting is that there were other groups that were around at the time, that at least relatively at the time, that, um, you know, weren't obviously dinosaurs. You know, uh, turtles came onto the scene at that time, but that's not to say that turtles were going to take over the earth per se. But, you know, there were other lineages. Um, there's this one... I think the Tuatara or something like that. I think that's how it's called. They only live on. They're called. They're considered living fossils at this point. But they kind of their lineage originated around the same time as the dinosaurs and the turtles, uh, and uh, you know they they're now just on some islands off the coast of north and the north and south island of New Zealand. But they used to be on the actual islands before they were killed off by you know the Pacific Islander people or whatever. But, uh, you know, there's a number of lineages, but also the other one was mammals. And mammals, as we all know and love, stand with our bodies under, you know, above our legs, you know, like a bridge or whatever. (laughs) And, uh, you know, why didn't the mammals then take over then? And why did the dinosaurs? And I think the only (laughs) explanation that I... I am aware of at this moment anyway, is that the, just the dinosaurs did it first. They just kind of, they were ready to go before, you know, the mammals were. Mammals were getting their shit together and the dinosaurs were already packed and ready to go. They were like, okay, next opportunity, I'm taking it, you know? And I think that's merely the reason, This, you know, the, the only good reason for why. Because there was obviously a lot happening evolutionarily at the time. And so anyway... That, so that's that. And does that, uh, does that yeah. just mean on day one when mass extinction happens and all of this these resources are made available, mm-hmm. or there's all this space that deve- that appears, that at that moment there were fitter dinosaur phenotypes than mammal ones? What do you mean? Yeah, they I were think that's a better that's a good way to put it. Okay. They were you know, there there was uh you know, they were just, you know, chance favors the prepared and they were just more prepared to take over. Um, but that's, I mean, I don't, I couldn't go to a paper where someone really outlines a real argument and has data and all these evidentiary premises to support it and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, so that's that. And so then they diversified and they kind of, you know, were able to exploit this really wide range of form and function, you know, like... You know, the, it, certainly in size, they were able to do it. But there were still small dinosaurs. Um, look at birds. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, but there were some, obviously, that had, you know, uh, long necks that had a certain form and functionality to them. And there were others that were, you know, just giant heads of teeth, you know. And there were others that had spikes and horns and, you know, some were on two legs, some were on four. And they were clearly, like accessing whatever the resources were to the best of their ability with what they had available to them evolutionarily or whatever. And they were, you know, doing a good job of it. Um, But as far as diversity is concerned, this is the one thing that is kind of funny to me. Um, Not funny, but worth noting is that the non-avian dinosaurs, the ones that live from 240 million to... 66 million years ago, uh, were not super, like, numerous. They, you know, one estimate uh, has them between, like, 1,500 and 2,500 taxa at the species level. Um, And today alone, like, just on Earth today, there's, like, over 5,000 mammal species. So that estimate that ranges from 1,500 to 2,500, that range is, like, total over that entire period of time that's the estimate for however many number of 
dinosaur species. Okay. And this takes into account uh, all the biases in the fossil record and all that kind of stuff. It's a statistical model that was used relatively recently. And I don't know exactly where it stands, what the complaints are about the model. There's always complaints. Everything's always provisional, you know, but that was one estimate. And I'm thinking, man, that's not a lot, you know. Basically, on average, about 2,000 uh, dinosaurs, anyway, um, that ever lived. You know, that's crazy. But um, I don't know. If it's correct, though, like, I think, it, it, you know, one reason why it might be is because dinosaurs were large. And one of the things about large animals is that it takes them a long time to get to their big size for the most part. And so then when they're ready, they're mature to have babies, then, you know, that's going to be a while. And so they're not going to be rapidly reproducing. Like, you know, obviously bacteria, some take only 20 minutes or less, you know. Uh, Whereas, you know, humans, the generation time is something like 25 years. I mean, these things can change. And, of course, these are overlapping generations. But, you know, it takes a while with big animals, you know. And so maybe that's part of the reason why they just weren't as diverse because they just didn't have, for for a lot of them anyway, the ability to just make a lot of themselves in the same way that something smaller like mice or whatever might. Um, and if you look at the you know diversity of mammals today, post Pleistocene mass extinction and all that, uh, but even if you include the Pleistocene. Uh, it's kind of it's it's very much skewed towards small size in mammals. So there's a lot of small mammals. Um, and there's another thing. It's kind of like this. Uh, there's this idea is in qualitative research, as I, I think, and I like it. It's called maximum variation sampling. And it's sort of like I was talking about. Hey, there's some that are on two legs, some that are on four, some that are have you know horns and armor and whatnot. And some are just like big teeth meat eaters, and some have long necks, and some you know like all that kind of. Some are small, some are large, and it's kind of like you're just sort of op- you're just like maxing out that space, that eco space or the ecomorpho space or whatever you want to call it, and you're not filling it in really you know, densely, but you know, you're, you're covering your bases or whatever. And I kind of think that sort of seems like what dinosaurs were able to do. And they were able to be pretty successful when they did it. Um, but you know, the other thing is that, you know, I don't know. It's like how many animal mammals, though they may not do everything exactly the same, of course, but how many different mammal quote unquote species are all like considered, you could just be like, call them mouse. You know, like there's so many, there's so many. And it's like, but they're, they're not mice. You know, that kind of thing would happen to you if you've met a phylogeneticist or whatever, you know, uh, there's only one mouse or whatever, you know, that kind of thing, but they all basically take the same shape. They all kind of run scurry around, they eat nuts, they eat little insects, they, you know, like that kind of, <laughs> they just kind of do the same thing, you know? And anyway, uh, dinosaurs seem to not do, they don't crowd, it seems to me, that space as densely or whatever. They just kind of, oh, there's a bunch of us there, and that's about it. You know, that kind of thing. That could also be a problem for a, a group, uh, a, you know, an animal group, when, you know, you're, you know, uh, say there were some, you know, unfortunate events or seek, whatever. Like, you know, you're just not as diverse. You're big. It takes you a long time to get around to maintaining your populations. And maybe you're not doing it as well for one reason or another, or there's something else has come on the scene or something like that. And then boom, this thing comes down from the sky and knocks everybody out. And you're like, Oh, I can't do it anymore. You're like, you kind of wonder if that also contributed to their extinction, their demise. Um, but anyway, so that's, that's about all I have to say about diversity with the data dump. Go ahead. Dump on my data. Sounds great. <laughs> uh, but God damn it, why were they so large? And in particular, the fucking sauropods. These are the brontosaurus for you people who just want to go big, fierce, and extinct. Um, sauropods are, you know, they they just kind of look like they sort of have, you know, if you remove the the neck to the head and the tail from the butt to the end of the tail or whatever. If you remove those two things, those wigglies, 
He just took the body. It's like they just have the body of an elephant or something or like a mm -hmm. rhinoceros. It's just like, uh, like hulky mass of shit, you know, and literally. Um, and the thing about them is they're just they're huge. Like the I think the largest sauropod is part of the Titanosaur group or whatever called Argentinosaurus. And it might have been like, you know, about 100 feet or more in length from like, you know, the ruta to the tuta. Well, really to the to the tail, tip of the tail, whatever. Um, and then uh, definitely over 50 tons, you know, like that, those are the conservative estimates for these guys. But one of the things that's interesting about dinosaurs compared to mammals, it might be what restricts mammals from getting as big as some of the big dinosaurs got, is that apparently they have lighter bones, like just not as dense of the bone. And, uh, you know, their bones weren't as dense, whatever. Um, and they also, these sauropods evolved these super long necks, but their heads are like tiny. They They didn't like chew their food. They didn't masticate. They just like bite swallow that was what they did you know um and maybe that was kind of part of what helped them reach their huge size is because they weren't they could hold the head number one uh with these long necks the long necks in turn gave them i'm gonna use an american football analogy i apologize but it's like it gave them a great catch radius like wide receivers and tight ends you know they're often talked about as like oh you're a great catch radius because he could reach his arms and jump and all that kind of whatever so there's like a big window that a quarterback could throw the ball and the guy could potentially catch it or whatever and i feel like the same thing can apply to the idea of these necks of the sauropods is that they just they could reach really high they could even if they had to stand on their haunches some of them you know, and and just get to the tops of the branches. So it was like there were in many ways uh, potentially resources that were not really out of their reach. And since their necks were so long, they could probably even reach down low and grab stuff, you know. So there's that. Um, <clears throat> and then the bodies, though, apparently, and I don't know all the details of this, but they, it, it's been estimated that they've had, they may have had like super large and long intestinal tracts for this really prolonged digestion of these whole foods that they would just chomp and swallow. So anyway, so that's, there's some stuff about, gosh, they're so huge. The, the sauropods may not have been fierce. I don't think they were very athletic. They were just like, they had like pillars, not a ra pillar erect stance, mind you, I don't think. Uh, but just they had these like, columns for legs like elephants elephants just have like funk you know like these pillars like in greece or something anyway finally warm-blooded huh guys what <laughs> what i don't most places that i read people are like meh it was cool when bob backer wrote the book the dinosaur heresies in the 1970s i think it was 70s and he was a paleontologist kind of a cowboy kind of like guy, but he was kind of weird too. Cause he had, a... anyway, whatever. Um, don't judge people's appearance, Ryan. I told you, uh, but it seems like, uh, you know, maybe they didn't need to be warm blooded, especially the large ones because the sort of the thermal dissipation would be low for such small surface area to race uh, to volume ratios, you know, because they're, giant volumes it's like Knox. Knox is this this big hunk of chocolate and he's got a small surface area anyway um so I, that might be part of what allowed some of them to maintain you know energy levels potentially as they continued i don't know about the small ones but there were speaking of feathers there were feathers on some of these guys. So they had this, especially for the, the offspring, they find the fossilized remains of babies, juveniles, with like a halo that when you look closely is just a bunch of like downy feathers like you'd find on a bird, like a baby bird, just like a hatchling or whatever. Um, and so like even T-Rex, I guess, had those, you know? And it looks like 
some of these other more, you know, the adults would have had elaborate feathers and things like that as well. And um, I don't know. I wish I had thought of to look this up, but apparently they've even been able to figure out some of the colors of some of these things. So that's cool. But whatever. So are you saying that the, even some of the big famous ones that we've watched in our Disney movies and seen in our coloring books that were usually just uh, a green kind of scaly thing, like the lizards we know of today, is how we learned it when we were kids. But you're saying that now mo- many of these are thought to have been totally covered, like current birds, literally just like all feathered up? Especially, I don't know about, I don't think like the the big sauropod ones, um, and I don't think like the triceratops, as far as I understand, or any of those guys, but I do think that some of the theropods, the meat-eating kind, like the, I don't think that T-Rex was, but a lot of these velociraptors might have been. But they couldn't fly with the feathers. No, I think the feathers may have initially, you know, you, it's this whole exaptation idea where it's like, you know, maybe there's this thing that happens, this weird, funky mutation. And this, this is like this fluffiness around one of the birds or whatever. And it, you know, survives better because it stays warmer or whatever. Or maybe it's able to, you know, uh, be more aware and active than the other ones who were bleary eyed or something like that. And, and, you know, it passes those genes on natural selection, all that kind of stuff. And then later on though, maybe there's a, another change to some of the feathers or maybe some of them retain them to adulthood. And this is something that becomes important for birds later. Uh, this idea of pedamorphosis or whatever, uh, which is the retention of juvenile traits, so maybe then they keep them and they change colors or whatever, and they start to use them in displays potentially with mating rituals or whatever potentially. I don't, know. we don't, we weren't there, <laughs> but uh, you know that kind of thing could. That's a speculation. Um, there might be some evidence to support those things, <clears throat> but that idea that there would be feathers on dinosaurs, I think, is a thing now. Yeah, it's a thing. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. But speaking of feathers, birds, turkey, delicious. Um, yeah, so what's the deal? People call, you know, they say, yeah, birds are din- dinosaurs, didn't go extinct. Birds are dinosaurs. <laughs> right. What? What? God damn it. Well, as far as I can tell, it's all based on morphological comparisons because we don't have. Unlike Jurassic Park would tell you, we don't have dinosaur dino DNA. Uh, and um, and so they people have to rely on the comparing the shapes of the animals and the different features of the, of the skeletons and the fossil skeletal remains. But they do actually have imprints and things like that. Plus they get the feathers and, in some cases. Um, so birds, aves, however you want to talk about them, share a number of characteristics with, in particular, the Manoraptorin, uh, dinosaurs, which are, um, Celurosaurian theropod dinosaurs. Uh, some people even, I guess, call the birds now they call them celurosaurian Cilur- reptiles you know and like there's like for example one of these manoraptoran dinosaurs would be like the dromaeosaurids or whatever and so for instance there's the pelvic girdle and it's made up of the ilium the ischium and the pubis bone and in most dinosaurs the pubis bone is fairly long and it shoots in the uh anterior direction meaning towards a head but with the maneropterans um and you know uh and birds the pubis bone shoots in the posterior asterior direction um so it shoots towards the butt and it kind of is sort of not parallel but pointing in the same kind of direction i think is the ischium and so there's a there's that that's one thing 
Uh, and I'm not going to list all of the things, but there's a reversed fourth toe on the hind feet. And they all, of course, also have three toes forward, uh, pointing forward. Um, the pedomorphic thing I was hinting at or foreshadowing before, bird heads are like, they're pedomorphic looking because when the bird is a juvenile or even in an embryonic kind of state before hatching, the head doesn't really change when you do when people do like the mathematical geometrical analyses like the the heads just more or less just get bigger but they stay the same in their general proportions um and that's one thing the other thing so going from juvenile to adults the heads don't the proportions basically stay the same the size is what changes you know they got this big cranium and then they got the small shorter kind of muzzle um but when you look at juvenile crocodiles or embryonic crocodiles or and of course dinosaurs they all look the same like birds crocodiles dinosaurs not other lizard types or you know reptilians or amphibians but just these groups of quote unquote archosaurs as it's called um look like because there are preserved uh, I have to say there are preserved remains of juvenile or or you know uh, uh, dinosaurs or whatever, uh, newly hatched ones. Um, and so when you look at these, uh, you know, the skulls, for instance, the, the, the heads are just all very similar between birds, crocodiles, and dinosaurs and not similar with others. And then, um, but instead crocodiles, their morphological changes the proportions are much more exaggerated the trunk or not trunk the, the the muzzle grows much longer the you know the rostrum and all the you know the 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 jaws and stuff grow really long the the head stays more or less the same size and anyway the eye sockets get smaller relative to the rest of the skull similar with a lot of dinosaurs including these manoropterans of course so there's this uh you know that thing. And of course, again, feathers is another one. And then, uh, because we talked about feathers, um, and feathers then being the third stage being something like perhaps then after, uh, thermal capacities for f feathers, and then maybe potentially like something like mating or maybe even thermal later on in life or whatever as well. Then it became, uh, the ability for flight. There are flight feathers now in birds which have aerodynamic qualities to them um but then also birds as well as these animals part because of the printing i think that happens with the some of the dinosaurs that died and with of course crocodiles uh there they have scales and uh birds have scales on their feet if you don't you know what i mean like you know, obviously if everyone's looked at chicken skin it's hard to get a sense for scales there uh, but on the feet, you can see still see scales, and that the bird, the feathers derive from the scales, same way that like flower petals are derived from leaves. So that's the that's the uh, my understanding of uh, birds and their relationship to dinosaurs. Um, yep, and uh, gobble gobble. Happy Thanksgiving! <laughs> Pour on that manoraptor and gravy. Oh, my favorite! <laughs> I think that should that anyone who's listening to this, the next time you eat chicken, just be like, "Fuck me!" You know, for because for myself at least, it's not that dinosaur. It, it just wasn't mainstream. You know, when you're a kid growing up, you know, you think of dinosaurs, you think of one thing. You think of birds, you think of another, and then they're like, "No, they're related." So you gotta wonder, like, if you were to, like, kill an Archaeopteryx, which is an early bird or whatever, famous uh, fossil, um, would it have tasted like chicken? Or turkey? Or something? Would the meat have been similar? I wonder. Got it. They wouldn't have had uh, chicken breasts kind of thing, because there's no uh, plate. Uh, breastplate that there are in birds that that came later but still you gotta wonder is the meat did it taste like it? I'm sure I'm not alone in thinking this 
it on the list for time machine destinations. Yeah, I get that. Hey, and, and of course, if you and I ever had a time machine, we went back and we killed the dinosaur and cooked it and ate it, I would expect nothing less than you to say, tastes like chicken. <laughs>